Welcome to another episode of my podcast and my YouTube channel, Integrating Mental Social Health. I'm Sarah E. And um, I want to discuss a really hot topic right now. Borderline personality disorder versus complex PTSD. There's debate in the mental health professional community. There's debate in the DSM, how to, how to write it in there. And uh, there's debate in among peers, clients even, mental health consumers, mental health interests, you know, people interested in mental health, and um, people working in mental health, and people writing the DSM. I want to thank a woman that I've really been getting work, getting a lot out of with whose work I've been really getting a lot out of. Um, my latest diagnosis in 2015 was borderline personality disorder versus complex PTSD. There's still debate within myself and in the world whether or not we have BPD or complex PTSD when we're diagnosed with these things. There are a few things that I disagree with very strongly about these debates. Some people have claimed that um, people with um, complex PTSD do not have suicidal ideations or don't want to kill themselves, nor do they self-harm. It is not believed by, by some people that uh, people with complex PTSD have abandonment issues. Well, um, Anna Runkle, this woman that I've been getting a lot of work, you know, a lot out of her, with whom I've been getting a lot out of her work, pardon me about the grammar, you kind of know what I'm talking about, I'm getting a lot out of her work, it's really good work she's doing, she's talked about something called abandonment melange and referred to someone named Pete Walker about abandonment melange, so, um, I don't know why, um, people with complex PTSD would be said not to have abandonment issues, but borderlines do. I don't know why it would be said that uh, people with complex PTSD don't self-harm, but borderlines do. I don't know why it would be said that uh, people with complex PTSD would not be suicidal or have angry outbursts or have risky relationships when borderlines do. I sometimes wonder, this is my conjecture, this is my feeling, this is my, my assessment here, as a podcast maker and a YouTube user and social media user creator. Um, I wonder still if borderlines are still being persecuted for uh, seeking attention and for intentionally hurting people. I wonder if that's still a blanketed given. A blanketed given. Um, I've done study on the uh, subject of borderline and not all borderlines are like that. Some of us really do want to get better. In fact, I, ha I have a phrase that I've invented a few weeks ago called BIRD, B-I-R-D. Borderlines in recovery. Borderlines in recovery determined. Yeah, B-I-R-D, borderlines in recovery determined. That's my idea. Not all of us are intentionally wanting to self-destruct and... Um, hurt ourselves and hurt other people. You know, I'm, I'm saying this as someone who was diagnosed with it. I'm not saying this as someone who uh, has it, because there was a debate at the end of my involvement in the mental health system as a client. Um, my last therapist and psychiatrist thought that I had symptoms. You know, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't really assess it. The psychiatrist earlier... Earlier in my life, when I was in my 30s, like around 2001, 2002, 3, 4, 5, um, the diagnosis stood together with um, a couple of Axis one mental disorders, anxiety disorder and gen generalized anxiety disorder and um, major depression, which, you know, I did qualify to, you know, be in, be in treatment and care and get meds and um, collect uh, disability benefits. So uh, under those two diagnoses, I still had, you know, legitimate mental illness. 
Um, not to mention there were other psychiatrists that debated that I just had a personality disorder and I just needed to snap crap and uh, snap out of it and learn coping skills and uh, work. I don't know. So it's like a lot of debate about what I had and didn't have. And the last debate was, okay, she still has a, uh, Sarah still has an anxiety disorder, depression, and we don't know what she's got after that. We don't know what kind of access to things she's got. We don't know if she's got complex PTSD. And complex PTSD is not mentioned in the DSM. And the writers of the DSM are thinking about lumping, according to Anna Runkle, lumping um, complex PTSD along with BPD. Maybe it's because they, they still can't figure it out. But um, I beg to differ that um, people with complex PTSD don't share the symptoms, don't share the same symptoms. I believe that um, as a person dealing with symptoms of complex PTSD, I, I, I never know who's in on abusing me. I never knew who to trust and who not to. Um, I, uh, I get angry because I can't trust people. I don't know what's still going on in my life and what isn't. And then the other thing, uh, they say that borderlines have an identity issue. They don't know who they are. Complex PTSD people do know who they are. I never knew who I was. I was always defined by everyone else indefinitely. I was either a bad person or a good person. And in order to survive and preempt being abused further and being shamed further, I automatically adopted an idea that I was a bad person. And it ran away with itself. I, I was able to let them brainwash me, and I was able to brainwash myself with this distorted idea of who I was. And then when you're dealing with a society that puts you down and still talks about self-esteem out of the side of their mouth... That's my conjecture as well. It's difficult to feel safe liking yourself, loving yourself, or feeling like thinking that you're a good person and that you're safe in the world. It's hard to believe when you're abused, when you've been abused for such a long time, or when you feel like abuse has been normalized for such a long time. You know, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, uh, physical abuse. Uh, when, when you grow up with someone... Who, who who says they want to hit you, who all the time, every day says they want to hit you, you know, pardon me, this is kind of activating right now, or someone who doesn't like the idea of your mother having, your mother having you, uh, that was my aunt, my aunt, her sister, she didn't want to feel like she had to take care of me, but uh, she chose to take care of me, but I had to deal with that, so I grew up in a world where I didn't feel safe in love, I didn't feel like there was any such thing for me as love. And so uh, the mental health community turns around and says, okay, so you've got a problem with trust. You've got a personality disorder. Wait a minute. And I feel judged. I feel judged again. Well, you don't trust us. <sighs> I feel like this personality disorder thing is is like a put-down. Um, now, com complex PTSD... Um, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. That says disorder too, but there's nothing about someone's personality. And yet, um, the, you know, some people claim that, okay, we're not suicidal, we don't self-harm, and uh, we, don't have, we don't have a problem knowing who we are, blah, 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 blah. We're, we're stabler, we're, you know, what is this? Uh, I'm going to post some links after this presentation. So you guys maybe can do your own research and see for yourself, because I, I did some reading on those websites as well. There is a lot of overlap. There is a lot of confusion and a lot of debate. But um, I don't agree with Anna Runkle about her um, assessment that we don't self-harm and we don't feel suicidal. And uh, we, you know, the thing about the self-harm thing really got me. Um, I started self-harming when I was 14. Because I was trying to, I didn't know it at the time. I did my own study, of course, because I, I couldn't get therapy, you know, because of the, the money. Um, I couldn't get th the therapy. Because um, the only thing I could afford, again, was the behavioral approach. But my own research suggested that I self-harmed 
to preempt more attack. I self-harmed to uh, numb the pain. I self-harmed to feel like I was in control. And uh, when I was 11 years old, I remember the very first day I wanted to kill myself, I, or I thought I wanted to kill myself. I didn't do that to get attention either. I was riding my bike around the block in Albany, and um, I, I, I started wondering, I wonder what it would be like to just check out of here. Really, I wondered what that would be like. And um, I didn't do that to get attention. I wrote my first suicide note to my care, my caretaker when I was 12, and she tore it up and threw it in the trash and said, I'm going to forget you even wrote that wrote me that note. When you get invalidated once again, see? I tried to get help for a long time, and uh, people believed I was just trying to get attention. And then when I got that diagnosis when I was in my 30s, it's like, okay, um, I can't ask for help because they're going to think I'm just getting, trying to get attention. And, um, when someone is diagnosed with complex PTSD, um, when you get complex PTSD, it's because you, you believe that the abuse is not going to end. You know, you, you go through abuse that doesn't end. Bullying at school all my life. Um, verbal abuse by my aunt until I ran away from home. Um, and she's still in my mind. She was even still in my mind after she passed away in uh, 2008. Um, so, uh, and then abandonment, you know, go figure. Is abandonment not a trauma? Abandonment is a trauma too. Many people with complex PTSD, according to Anna Runkle, go through something called abandonment melange. When they feel like they're not part of the world and they go through a combination of rage and grief and terror. I did. I do. Every time something doesn't go my way, or every time I'm, I'm left, or every time uh, someone criticizes me, or every time I feel unlovable again, I go through that. So that that's automatically borderline. When, when you have abandonment issues, that's borderline. You're trying to get attention. Whew. Okay, my five modules of mental wellness. I'm responsible for the way I act. I am responsible for my attitude. I am responsible for learning skills on how to regulate my emotions and self-soothe. I also need to validate what happened to me. Anything that happens to anyone is their individual life experiences. That's why I have a life experiences module. We all deserve to be validated. We all deserve a life purpose. And uh, who, want, who wants to be told that their life purpose is, is always self-destruction and that's all and that's who they are? That's the last thing many of us want to hear, especially when we're trying to when we are trying to get better, we are trying to get help, we're trying to feel better, we're trying to find relief. GD it. So um if we feel like suicide is the only relief, it's understandable. If we feel like self-harm is the only way we feel like we can be in control, that's understandable. And I'm not saying it's okay. I'm not making it okay at all. What I feel is not okay is the is the continued invalidation. And um, I can forgive more if we can if we can plead ignorance and say, yeah, we don't know everything. And uh, Anna Runkle, I'm still going to continue to watch your videos. You're doing such great work. But um, I hope I hope you're still learning too. Because uh, I don't I don't agree. I don't believe that. I don't believe that someone who self harms does not have complex PTSD. We're trying to be in control sometimes. Come on. Come on, mental health communities. Give us a break. And I'll end with this. We are responsible for how we deal with things, regardless of what we have or don't have. We deserve validation, regardless of what we have and don't have. We deserve to live and be on this planet and feel like we're okay, regardless of what we have or don't have. Come on, before you write the next thing in the DSM, let's think about that. Be safe.